Um, are we ready to get started? Yeah, um, Bergen's ready. I could get the email chain started up if everyone just drops their emails in the chat. Give us like five minutes or so because we're getting ready. Yeah, I'll just get the email chain started and you can let us know. It looks like we're waiting on another judge anyway. I think there's only two of us here right now. Okay, I'm gonna hold off sending the email chain until the last judge is here because I don't wanna have to redo that.
Um, I think we have all three judges now. Um, I put, um, I think pretty much everyone, but the judge that just came in into the email chain. So if that judge wants to be a part of the email chain, if you could just drop your email in the chat, I could add you to it right now. Yeah, I can do that. Thanks. All right. I just sent out the chain. I might have spelled something wrong. So if anyone could just double everyone. Oh, wait, I didn't send it to Avatol. Oh God, okay. Give me one second, that's my bad. Okay, now I think I got it right. I'm sorry about that. I put like in asterisks and like all caps updated. So make sure if you're sending any evidence to send it in there instead of the old one because otherwise Avatol can't see it. My bad, sorry. <laughs>
Um, we're ready to begin whenever everyone else is. Bergen's good to go. All the judges? Yeah, I'm you good. And you. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. And just to confirm, Milburn is speaking first on the negative. That's fine. And if everyone's ready, then my time begins. Now, Milburn negates contention one is the Soviet impositions. The glitz of Columbia University explains that in 1998, Russian companies were getting destroyed by foreign competition, so Russia wanted to implement protectionist measures. However, the IMF offered Russia billions of dollars of loans insofar as it did not put in protection policies because those policies would have hurt American companies. But some one year after accepting the IMF loans, the Russian economy collapsed, increasing poverty by 40%, and Stiglitz implicates that their economy only recovered after putting in the protection five years later. Kundler 20 of UC Berkeley explains that in the wake of the economic crash, the Russian people turned towards open nationalism and hatred for Western countries like the US who they blame for their economic problems, causing them to elect a straw man, enabling the rise of Putin. Unfortunately, 20 years later, this has created the groundwork for a war. Wood 19 of U Chicago writes that Vladimir Putin is incentivized to be as militarily belligerent as possible against America in order to look strong for his people and satisfy their thirst for revenge, increasing the chance of miscalculation that could spiral into war. Fisher concludes that even a small scale war between Russia and America will kill a billion people. Contention 2 is the Lorax. Spanhauer writes in 2000 that the IMF focuses on export growth to pay back loans, causing unsustainable liquidation of natural resources. But Tika 2 adds, debts owed to the IMF cannot be rescheduled, compelling governments to overexploit natural resources for short-term gain. As a result, Reland 01 of Yale writes that IMF export-oriented development causes starkly higher rates of deforestation. Talkman 01 corroborates that the IMF's promotion of natural resource sectors has caused extensive deforestation across the global south. The destruction of forests means scores of people without basic necessities. The African Climate Reporters 18 finds that 1.6 billion of the world's poorest people rely on forests for food, income, or medical needs. Contention 3 is rich people problems. Casper 17 of MIU finds that IMF programs makes it more likely that the elite of a country revolts because one, whereas before they had uncertainty about the future, IMF programs clearly label out that they're going to lose money in the coming years. Two, while normally elites can contest government policies, they cannot lobby or go against the IMF so they lose economic power. And three, by overthrowing the government, the elites can get all of the money the IMF gave the government and wouldn't have to pay it back, funneling their greed. Elites have tremendous resources in developing countries so they have the capacity to start civil wars. For these reasons, Casper finds that IMF countries have increased the likelihood of elite-based civil wars by 290%. The overall impact is devastation. 912 of the University of Kentucky finalizes that civil wars have led to 10.4 million refugees, and Mueller 16 finds that civil wars cause a 18% decrease to GDP on average. This is highly destructive, as Sanchez 12 quantifies that a 1% decrease in GDP increases unemployment by 2%. Contention 4 is the Jeff Bezos dream. The IMF forces countries to crack down on unions and eliminate workers' rights. Oxfam 20 writes that IMF policies in 130 countries focus on structural labor market reforms that reduce the strength of collective bargaining. In fact, the ITUC 13 writes the IMF uses conditionality to attack collective bargaining and trade unions, threatening workers' rights with extinction. In poor countries, collective bargaining is the surest way out of poverty because it ensures that workers earn living wages. Thus, Ramos 10 finds the labor unions in the global south significantly reduce wage inequality. Tudor 10 of the Guardian summarizes trade unionism brings rights that are a vital component of lifting 1.4 billion workers around the world out of poverty. Contention 5 is obtaining the grain. Sonkin 20 of Wigan Higgin University finds that the IMF forces recipient countries to end government subsidies that support local farmers and crop production, forcing countries to privatize public farmland, allowing private equity funds to enter developing country markets and buy up all the land and charge record high prices for food, concluding that the IMF required nations to dissolve state-owned agricultural companies and agricultural development banks, ending farming financing. Overall, 43% of total IMF loans were part of liberalization of agriculture industries. The Bread and Woods Project 20 concludes that IMF policies cause private interest to pull out all investment in downturns, abandoning developing country food markets, crashing production down with no support from the government, finding the IMF is directly responsible for exacerbating food price spikes during times of recession like 08 or the pandemic. Tragically, Evanix 16 of the development group finalizes that a major food price spike increases global poverty on average by 13%, and that there is an exponential increase in poverty as the severity of price spikes goes up. Moreover, Mariano 18 terminalizes that the IMF land-grabbing policies have pushed 124 million people into starvation. Thus, we are proud to negate. Okay, just before I give case, can I call for a few cards? Sure. Um, I guess it's just like the link between like IMF and like Putin. I don't know if there was like lots of cards between there, maybe a yeah. few. Just like the link heavy, I guess. Okay. And then your evidence on deforestation on C2. Yeah. 
the 290 i'll just put these in the chat <laughs> there's a couple so which okay. deforestation ones do you want um like that it's due to the imf it's okay sure just i guess it's just link evidence yeah yeah that's fine <clears throat> okay so c1 putin c2 deforestation c3 the 290 percent yeah and c5 the that like they're ending agriculture and uh, the 24 mil 124 mil okay I can start case as soon as we receive those. Leah, which one should I get? Uh, can you get deforestation? Yeah, sure. And can you also get the 290%? Yeah. Which, like, ending agriculture card did you want i mean i think there was one that was just like a piece of link evidence that explained about like the general idea of imf to agriculture like ending the agriculture okay sure Maybe your best link evidence like whatever you think is your okay, best sure. link. yeah yeah i'll send the agriculture stuff Okay, I just sent the Lorax evidence. <clears throat> um, um, 290%. I think I just got that one. You just said this is 290, right? No, that was the Lorax evidence, the deforestation. Okay. This is all just deforestation? Yeah. And I just sent 290. Okay. My computer will just ding every time something comes through, so. Okay, cool. Here, I sent Russia and uh, agriculture. I just got Sophia saying the 290 and I just got Leo's. Okay, I think that's all of it. I will tell you good. Okay, perfect. Then just to make sure, this is Bergen speaking affirmative on the second. Everyone good? And everyone can hear me well, right? If there's a tech issue, just let me know. Okay. Avatol and I affirm our first contention is special drawing rights or SDRs. The SDR was created by the IMF to provide reserve assets to nations with Woods 09 writing that there is no conditionality involved and no required policy changes. Critically, SDRs are massively beneficial to improving crisis management. Indeed, the SDR allocated $182.6 billion in 2009 during the global financial crisis. Reuters 21 writes that these allocations are massive and free and totaled over $500 billion during COVID-19 alone, providing liquidity to poor countries hit hard by the pandemic without increasing their debt levels. The impact is reducing poverty. Gomez 20 writes massive increases in reserves, allow nations to cut <clears throat> to avoid cutting social spending, revitalizing economies through investment. This critical during COVID is Oxfam 20 rates that follow from the coronavirus pandemic could push half a billion more people into poverty. Our second contention is a wildfire spread. According to Cars 20 of the Brookings Institute, in 2020, emerging economies had about $11 trillion in external debt, much of which existed before the pandemic. The OECD 20 illustrates that COVID reduced pr private finance flows to developing economy 60% more than the 2008 crisis, exacerbating risks of development setbacks that could increase future pandemic and vulnerability. <clears throat> Thus, Vol Walsh 20 of the New York Times finds low-income countries have record high debt levels are now, and are at risk of a large debt crisis. Gregory 20 finds that the IMF provided as financial assistance through emergency and precautionary lending to 80 countries with 30 more seeking aid to rebuild financial safety nets as the pandemic continues. Gallagher of the Brookings Institute writes in October that the IMF evolved to help countries respond to COVID rather than using the one-size-fits-all approach that favors austerity. Lending prioritized health expenditures and social spending to help protect the most vulnerable. Gensler Marketplace explains in October that interest rates are extremely low given the current crisis and furthermore the IMF is giving these countries more time to repay any debts. According to Coast of the World Bank, as debt piles up shaken investors sell off their assets en masse and the economy suffers worsening the crisis causing investor confidence to plummet. Runaway debt leads to long-term financial crises, decreased investment, and GDP for decades. Importantly, Sashetti finds an 11 as debt 
levels increase, borrowers' ability to repay becomes more sensitive. For a given shock, the higher debts are, the higher the probability of default. Even in mild shocks, indebted borrowers may no longer be regarded as credit worthy. Less lending leads to consumption and investment falling. Chen 15 of the National Taiwan University finds in the face of uncertainty in international financial markets, investors will shift money from riskier to safer options, and the IMF provides the necessary insurance. Unfortunately, Investopedia writes in 2020 that a debt crisis in one country frequently spreads economic pain to other countries. A clear example is the Asian debt crisis, as they furthered that the problem of the crisis quickly spread to other Asian countries and interest rates surged as nations tried to slow the outflows of capital, bringing economic growth to a halt. Kweper 20 concludes that the Asian financial crisis was ultimately solved by the International Monetary Fund, which provided the loans necessary to stabilize the troubled Asian economies. The organization had committed more than $110 billion in short-term loans to Thailand, Indonesia, and South Korea to help stabilize their economies. Additionally, Corsetti 04 of the Croatian National Bank finds in response to IMF bailouts, Mexico, Argentina, Korea, and Brazil all saw relatively rapid economic growth and saw their debt stabilize. Rugi 20 finds that there <clears throat> that every study finds a negative relationship between high levels of government debt and economic growth. The empirical evidence overwhelmingly supports the view that a large amount of government debt has a negative impact on economic growth potential. This is especially important because Bajoria 08 concludes that a 1% decline in developing country growth rates traps an additional 20 million people into poverty. <clears throat> this is extremely relevant as Stiglitz 20 finds that a global debt crisis today will push millions of people into unemployment around the world. Thus, we're proud to affirm. Um, Sophia, do you want to see any cards? I think we're good. Okay. Then I'm ready for the cards. <clears throat> yeah, whenever you are, I'm good. Cool. Give me one second. Okay, since we spoke first, can I get a first question? Yeah, of course. And time starts now. So on your contention too, what actually happened like before the Asian financial crisis? Like what caused the Asian financial crisis? I mean, that's just like history. There were like credit changes that in increase like interest rates that affected a lot of currencies across the continent or like regions of the continent, I guess. Yeah, there's also like, oh, there's also <clears throat> like moral hazard had occurred before the Asian financial crisis, right? I mean, I feel like the issue with the idea of moral hazard is that if countries are in a bad economic position, the risk is low for moral hazard to the point that you shouldn't let countries' economies suffer just because of a small risk they may do something bad. Like, you always have a moral hazard with any decision you make, it's that the benefit, like the benefits outweigh the harms in the sense that you could be saving an economy in exchange, or at least for even if it's for a short amount of time, you're still saving on net. Can I have a question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Can you just like, explain the link chain of your C1? Because I'm really confused about how you get from like IMF and Russia into like nationalism, Putin and miscalculation. Yeah, of course. So basically what Stiglitz tells you is that before the Russian economy needed protectionist policies, so Yeltsin was going to implement them, but what happened was the IMF gave them loans, but they had to stop all the protectionist policies because these policies would have hurt American companies. So when they did that, it obviously crashed their economy because they liberalized way too quickly, which means foreign competition crowded out all the local industries and that increased poverty by 40%. And because of all these economic problems, the Russian people blamed Western countries like the US and like obviously the institutions like the IMF. So they elected Putin. And we tell you that Putin is like, incentivized to be like to be militarily belligerent against the u.s and we also have like specific evidence why it's more like he's going to start a nuclear war now like yeah i'm a little bit confused as to like the bright line of your argument right like as to when it happens because this happened like a while ago right so like why is this issue like specifically important if we haven't seen retaliation yet like if we haven't seen like a nuclear war because putin's been in power for a while yeah i know that's the evidence of like we can we can show you the evidence after but like basically what it says is that a right russia the tensions between the russia and the us are very high right now and b they have a much weaker conventional military so they're more likely to use nukes can yeah I get I, yeah okay that's fine yeah so like back on this um wildfire thing like what's the alternative if we don't have the imf lending to these countries break it and bailing them out i i mean I would I would say that we don't need to look at an alternative if we say the that the IMF is good, like. 
Well, I don't know why I should be providing you with an al alternative if like I'm saying that the IMF is good. Like I have no reason to do that because that wouldn't. Like yeah, we would argue that the alternatives are much better because they wouldn't have to like, because the, the IMF just trapped them in these debt crises. So they have to default like over and over again and ask for bailouts. But that's cool. We can discuss that in rebuttal. I'm going to call Leo and we'll start prep time when the call goes through. That was 48 seconds. Okay. Um, order is going to be overview and then down their case. <laughs> okay. Is anyone not ready? Cool. <clears throat> Start on an overview on their case. The IMF wants to pursue bad policies. The Global Exchange 11 finds that the IMF gives rich countries a disproportionate share of power in determining policies because decision making power is determined by how much a nation donates to the IMF's budget. That's why Ghazali 19 finds that the IMF wants nations to have their economies destroyed and permanently indebted so that rich countries can maintain control. Proven in the Global South when the IMF specifically designed policies to prevent them from industrializing so that rich nations wouldn't have competition and could continue extracting resources and capital from the developing world. The UN finds that Africa is less industrialized now than it was 40 years ago, plunging millions more into poverty, coupled with less social spending. Richard O'Neill finds that IMF policies kill 6 million children a year. This is the implication of this, is not only a case term, but also on evidence, because we prove that IMF has bad incentives, which is why when there's clashing evidence in this round, you always prefer our side. Then two turns at the top. First, war, because IMF loans often are too easy on dictatorships, which is why Wu15 finds that 30% of the time, dictators channel the money into military spending in order to increase popular support by starting wars or genocide, and Shaw 13 finds that corrupt governments use it to wreck economic stability, which Sam 96 finds kills 24,000 people per month. For example, to Saint 21 quantifies that the IMF loans directly funded the Rwandan genocide. This serves as a prereq to their case because once there is a war, there is no confidence and there is more debt taken on during wars. But then second, bad policies, the IMF creates revolving doors because Heffler 98 finds that IMF assistance encourages risky policy and access lending in countries that know their losses are covered, sparking 100 banking crises across the developing world, decreasing growth by 20%. Ronto 19 quantifies that 78% of IMF loans are followed up with another program in three years, meaning that there's no terminal impact on their case. Then on SDR specifically, first D-Link game, Martin 20 of Bloomberg finds that they're allotted to countries in proportion to their voting share, which is why rich countries get 70% and just 3% go to the poorest nations. But then second, they're, even when they are allocated, they're tiny during the biggest allocation in 09. They say that it helped a lot of people, but the Financial Times write that they only amounted to 1% of global trade and had a negligible effect on global growth. Uh, then on C2, turn it because the IMF got us here. Oxford 20 finds that the reason COVID has been so prolonged and devastating is that over 80% of IMF loans still force countries to adopt austerity policies. In Ecuador, for example, healthcare spending was cut by the IMF by two thirds, making them in unable to recover from COVID. But then turn it again, defaults are comparatively better. Kuiper 20 writes that countries simply restructure followed by a period of rapid growth after they default. For example, Iceland in 08 let its largest banks collapse without bailing them out with foreign aid and it quickly recovered. But uh, uh, Reland 01 does the empirical comparative. If countries never had an agreement, they would have grown 60, 76% faster because the IMF destroys their economic structures. Then fourth turn in IMF again, um, IMF pro programs increase debt because Lee 15 continues that IMF bailouts significantly increase the probability of subsequent sovereign defaults by approximately 1.5 to 2% because they take away social spending and social spending is essential to um, 
solving back for debt crises. On their investment link, they don't increase investment. And this investment link is really important in this round because what our argument on our contention five about agriculture is that because the IMF lets private industries take over the public sectors, that means that during downturns, which is also their link, the investment goes out, which is really important because it means that during every single downturn in the future, once the IMF intervenes, every single sector of the country loses all investment compared to the government who wouldn't pull out during these times. Then specifically on the Asian financial crisis, the IMF caused it in the first place. Essential action finds that the financial meltdown was caused by reliance on short-term loans that came from the IMF's advice. This always on prereq because even if the IMF dampened the effects of the crisis, it wouldn't have happened at all if not for the IMF's advice. Also, um, it made loans on conditional structure adjustment policies, which cut spending and deepened the economic slowdown. And B, it failed to manage a rollover of short-term loans to long-term loans, which were needed to get out of the crisis. The IMF admitted themselves in retrospect that they made the crisis worse. Then Malaysia was the only country that refused IMF assistance and advice and suffered far less economic problems than other countries. There's no way to vote for them. Call for some evidence. <clears throat> um, first, that the IMF caused the Asian debt crisis. And um, you cut out like halfway for me um, on your second turn to our C2. My, my like Zoom said interconnect connection, so it was probably oh, just okay. me. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, sh I'll just send you what I wrote. Okay. And Actually, I think, you want me to like explain it real quick? Whatever is. I'll just send you the cards with the rest. Okay. Um. And also on the first case turn that the Rwandan genocide was caused by the IMF. Okay. I'll get that and I'll send my second response. Leo, can you send the Asian financial crisis thing? Yeah, I got it. Perfect. We'll start prep as soon as we get those. And um, Asian financial crisis. Okay. My computer will ding. Okay, so I called for Rhonda, Asian, and that response. Okay, so I'm waiting on like three things pretty much. Okay, I just got the Asian financial crisis. I won't read it yet. We're not running prep. Okay, everything's sent. Okay, my computer will ding and I'll call Avatol as soon as we get it. Avatol, you do need prep, right? Okay. Okay. And that's everything? Okay, perfect. I'm calling Avatol right now. Prep starts now. Okay, that was 35 seconds. This will be pretty fast because I have a lot to cover. So if you miss anything, just let me know. I'll gladly repeat. Is everyone, is everybody ready? Um, if you're going fast, do you mind sending a speech talk or? I'm not going to be spreading. I just mean, yeah. it, it, if you need it, we can send it, but I really doubt it's going to be that fast. It's not going to be that fast. I'm just saying it might be a little bit fast. That's fine. Okay.
Time will start now. The first response they give you to our case is about how they're giving rich, giving rich power. But if rich countries are investing in providing the money to bail countries out, there is no reason that they shouldn't have a say. Rich countries like, in, like investing in developing countries as well. And then they tell you about war and genocide and dictators. But we would say that inequality and social spending control the internal Lincoln's genocide and conflict, and we'll answer that when it gets to their case. Then ev their evidence doesn't even say that the IMF specifically why that happens, which means you don't see any, any reason why it's going to happen on their case. Then they talk about moral hazard. But we would say this is a benefits outweigh the harms topic. Moral hazard doesn't is not not worth jeopardizing economies. And we would say 51 empirical studies which examine the investing environments of countries show that there's no reason there's key controls for other con contributors of irresponsible lending and they show that there's no moral hazard effect. Then they give you they talk to you about 80% austerity measures and they give, give you the Ecuador example. But IMF bailouts across the board are still much better. One isolated example doesn't mean all harms outweigh the benefits. And then they tell you that defaults are good, but then they tell you that IMF increases debt and increases defaults. This is a huge contradiction. Don't let them go for both of these responses. But anyway, at turn, the IMF reduces the risk of default because Rogoff 10 finds that the IMF charges low interest rates, which allow troubled debtors time to adjust to shifts in international lending. That's why they conclude that IMF supported programs significantly reduce the likelihood of defaults by 1.3%. Then they talk about investment, which is a cross up of their case. I'll get to that there. Then they talk to you about how the IMF caused the Asian debt crisis from an organization that campaigns against the IMF. IMF, we say that we help them with short-term loans anyway. Then they talk to you about IMF making it worse, but we would say long in the long term, they made it better. Finally, on Malaysia, it's one example. Other countries are doing better now. And if it wasn't for the IMF's insistence that IMF gov that Asian governments guarantee the loans of private banks, it would have been much worse. And we can talk about that later. But then on their first contention about Soviet imposition, the IMF didn't cause the issue, Gorbachev's decision to allow elections with a multi-party system and create a presidency for the Soviet Union began a slow process of de democratization that eventually contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. This argument is pretty much just focusing on one example where they think the IMF was not successful. This goes back to our second contention as we explained that the IMF bailouts provide the money needed to get countries out of debt in the first place, and they don't give you a war and why tensions are especially high right now. This argument is pretty much ridiculous. Go to their second contention on resources. First, you can non-unique because if countries are in a recession and receiving IMF loans, they would have continued to exploit resources regardless. But then on a prereq, if there's, ec if there's economic collapse that's spikes resource extraction because the public desperately needs more resources and rapid growth. This link outweighs on scope because an economic recession which causes mass resource extraction is a lot larger than a few countries doing so because the IMF told them to. And then you can turn it one more time because an increase in exports is good. Koopman 19 finds that since the 1990s, more than 1 billion people have been lifted out of poverty because of growth underpinned by trade. We can weigh this on empirics because trade reforms in Vietnam in the 80s and 90s transformed the country into an export powerhouse which sharply reduced poverty. Go to your third contention about civil war and dictatorships. First, you can turn because IMF loans are used to leverage countries to become more peaceful because it's good for development. So John 19 explains that IMF is holding Pakistan's feet to the fire on the issue of terrorism, using conditionality to force the nation to crack down on its terror cells. Then second, you can turn it again because conflict is most strongly correlated with inequality as it creates social strife and gives incentive to go to war. Bert et al. 20, 2020 explains that when controlling for selection bias, IMF loans empirically have a significant negative effect on income inequality over eight points, which means it goes down in our world. But then you can all unique it because most countries that go into that go into the civil wars in the past few decades are less developed nations who already had high levels of violence, severe social and economic problems and low levels of social spending to begin with. They can't prove the IMF is the brink. These, there are other alternatives like ethnic divides, inequality, lack of, of rights, freedom, et cetera. The econ debate controls the internal linkage to stability anyway. So this debate is one on our keys, not the rest of the flow. But it's last you can turn because SAPs are good for the long-term growth for the long-term. Shoulder and 76 explains that historically, most IMF programs have pursued their objectives and improved living standards to higher growth. Then on general responses to their last two contentions. First, dealing because the IMF is fixing issues. IMF modernized conditionality, introducing a new flexible credit line, enhancing flexibility, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of different reforms that have been since undertaken, which are really good. But then second, dealing with the IMF is not a development bank and unlike the World Bank and other development agencies, it does not finance projects. So the only way to ensure precautionary finance measures is through loan conditionality, specifically on contention four. We would say that you can not unique it because Tetlo 17 explained that workers fail to benefit fully from economic growth because of technological progress, which has made it easier to automate tasks. In fact, half of the decline in national income in advanced countries can be attributed to this. And then second, on the second contention, on the last contention, agriculture, we would say non unique because the HRC 20 finds that the UN helps 86.7 million people in 83 countries every year by delivering food assistance, the problem is solved regardless in our world. But then you uh, back to our case really quickly, the 80% evidence was a recommendation, not a necessity from Oxfam, which means you're not actually seeing it happen. Very, very proud to affirm. Are you ready for Crossfire? Before Cross, can I see the evidence that, um, like, actually, wait, can you send the first response to our C2 on the Lorax? And then can you clarify where the IMF fixing issues and not financing projects is a response to? The, when I was talking about reforms, that was like a general response to C4 and C5. Okay, got it. Like what I did is I said, on C4 and C5, these are the responses. Okay, okay. Um, I think that's fine with the evidence. Wait, Just I wanna see, yeah, oh. can I see one piece? Just that like, they don't cause moral hazard. Oh, the study, yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you put those, I think that was three cards then. Can you put those in the chat, please? Avatar, can you take care of that? I'll get moral hazard right now. I kind of forgot the other two. <laughs> okay. 
first response to C2. I don't have the blocks open, so I think you need to get them. Could you also send IMF decreases income inequality? Okay, moral hazard is sent. I'm taking care of the other ones right now. Oh, okay. The first response to C2 is kind of analytical. It was that if countries are in a recession, they would have continued to exploit resources. So it's a non-unique. Okay, got it. And I'm getting the decrease. I'm getting, oh here. wait, I got income inequality. Okay, I just said income inequality. Okay, I think I got it. If you need any clarification, the income inequality is bird. Noi is Avatol. Moral hazard, there's no moral hazard. Yeah. I only got, wait, hold on. I only got the bird evidence so far. Um, Noi 03, is it above? I think it says reply all. Oh, got it, got it, I see. Okay, we're good then. Okay. I'm ready for cross. Awesome. You can have first question whenever you're ready. Okay. So on your first contention about SDRs, you say that there's no conditionality, but then against our case, you say turn because structural adjustment policies are good. Is your position that structural policies are good, which means SDRs are bad, or that SDRs are good and that structural adjustment policies are bad? Okay. So first of all, we're collapsing on the second contention. So they're both good based on, but anyway, they're like both good based on the scenario. So we would say like, it depends. Why does it depend? Because in some cases, SDRs can be good in comparison to SAPs and then it can be vice versa. But SDRs are different than SAPs. SDRs are alone without conditionality. But right. if conditionality, as you say, is yeah, like we most parts good, then aren't SDRs really bad because they don't have conditionality? No, because we say that, okay, the thing about conditionality is that condition, like the response that I give is that kind of conditionality sometimes required for the IMF because they're not like a, they're not like specifically like a bank, like the World Bank. So we would say that SAPs can be really beneficial in, in some cases, and we say that SDRs can be really beneficial in some cases. It doesn't, it's not really a contradiction, but can I have a question, please? Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's talk about this overview, or no, actually, let's talk about your fourth and fifth contentions. Do they both rely on conditionalities, the internal link? Not really, no, because for the Jeff Bezos okay, then, thing, oh, oh, do you want me to explain more? Is that fine? No, uh, can you can you ex clarify, please? Yeah, sure. So for the unionization, it's mostly that they ignore unions and they don't let them come to the bargaining table, which is why unions are inevitably hurt by IMF policies. So that's regardless of whether or not there is conditionality and obtaining the grain. That's about like private investment flooding in and crowding out public and like the government no longer invests. So then it's mostly private investors and it's also about cutting subsidies. But how does so like, cutting subsidies is conditionality but the private investment is not okay but how does the imf relate back into that really quickly sorry because when the imf comes in it brings along private investment into these sectors like it forces the government to, like i guess it's forcing the government to cut spending for some instances but i guess we both agree that structural adjustment policies are like you say that they're good so like we'll debate that can i get a question all right so let's talk about the overview right so on the overview, your only response is that there's no reasons why rich countries would do this. 
But if we tell you that don't rich countries want to maximize their own profits and resources in the world? Well, we would say that rich countries are still investing into developing countries, which was another response I gave to that overview, which means that they're still doing better. But anyway, we would say it's not fair to say that because the like the rich countries are investing and giving all of this money into the IMF, they shouldn't have a say. Like that's not how democracy works. Right. Sure. So like, of course they have a say, but it's bad because when they have a say, a lot of the times, according to our evidence, they use it and they make sure that the poor yeah. countries don't develop so they because can take advantage of the resources. Sure. But they're still trying. Okay, yeah, that's cross. Okay, we have over two minutes left and we're gonna take some time starting now. Um, how much prep was that, Sophia? That was all our prep. Okay. Um, so the order is going to be our case, um, weighing, then the overview, and then their case. Is everyone good? All signposts. So I'll be clear where I am. Okay. Everyone's ready. Put a timer. My time starts now. Start on our case. They give me a couple turns here. We'll first concede to non-unique on our first contention. On our on our second contention, they say that these people need the resources. However, that's not our wink. Our wink is that deforestation is really bad because people rely on deforest for their resources. So when you cut them down, you're not get, like giving more resources to the people. Then they say trade is good. We agree, long-term liberalization is good. But the IMF doing it specifically bad because they just go into these countries and quickly extract all the resources. They cut down all the forests extremely quickly. That's why the people are hurt. Then on then on on security, this all. And like our, our civil war argument, they first say it's good for income equality. They're like the evidence says there's no significant decline. Moreover, they don't respond to the fact that dictators literally use the IMF loans to finance th these conflicts. That's the root cause of these conflicts in the first place. That's the root cause of these conflicts in the first place. It doesn't matter like how the economy is. Again, they also don't extend any implication of these terms. Don't vote for them there. But then on the most important argument is in this round, which is our argument about obtaining the grain and agriculture. Our warrant is that when the IMF comes in, it forces them to end subsidies, privates all the land, and allow private funds from abroad to buy up all the land, which is why overall Sonkin tells you that 43% of all loans require liberalization. But Bread and Woods 20 tells you that this private investment is really bad because when the entire agriculture sector is 
controlled by them, uh, by the private investment. They all abandoned these markets during economic downturns, which is why they exaggerate price spikes during, during recessions. We outweigh them on the on the Warren level because their own Warren tells you that investors are going to pull out in downturns because these investors see that the, uh, these countries are in deteriorating economic conditions. There's no incentive for them to stay there. That's why overall, if NX16 tells you each food price spikes increases global poverty by 13%, a Mariona 18 tells you that 124 million people are pushed into starvation because of these land grabbing policies. They give a couple of responses. First, they say there's no conditionality. A, the auction card still tells you 80% are mandating it. B, it doesn't matter because these countries have already seen the bad effects of these land grabbing policies manifest. Then they say there's, the IMF doesn't finance the policies. That doesn't matter. Like That's not our link. Our link is about the private investment seizing all the land. Then lastly, they say the UN helps 87 million people. The Mariano evidence takes that into account and still tells you that 124 million are pushing to starvation uniquely because, because of IMF policies. This outweighs them for a couple, for two reasons. First is on a prerequisite because they talk about all these economic recovery programs, but without a stable food supply, these countries can't do economic development in the first place. There's also means there's no surplus for trade. So overall, when you destroy the entire agricultural sector and people are starving, you can't have economic development. Moreover, we outweigh them on time frame because in the, in the future, every time a recession happens, the agriculture sector crashes because investments pulls out which, and the IMF makes makes that happen, which means these economies can never develop in the long run because every time a recession happens, their economy is ruined. Now, in their case, quickly on the overview, they drop, like, sure, the, the the bailouts might happen, but it doesn't matter because the global exchange evidence still tells you that the, the IMF is supposed to serve private, uh, private interests and give rich countries around creates a disproportionate share of power, which is why overall, uh, they still have extremely bad policies. The the moral hazard, like their evidence doesn't give any warranty. We give you the warranty. The IMF uh, gives them no, let them know that their losses are covered, which is why overall, they spark 100 banking crises across the developing world, decreasing growth by 20%. This outweighs them in the long run, because in the long run, economic growth is much lower with the IMF. Um, wait, did you guys send the evidence earlier that like dictators use the like you asked for Rwanda, right? We sent yeah. That. It's just that. Well, there's the other ones, but you didn't ask for them. Do you want me to send them too? Yeah, can I just have some of the link, Abby? Like which one? Um, just that like the money goes to the dictators. Okay. Oh wait, by the way, this is about your C3. It's not about the turn on war, like on our case. Oh, okay. Well, I just- Yeah, that's what, I think that's why I was also curious. send the C3 evidence. Yeah. I think I just got it. Let me call you. Okay, that was the, that was the Wu evidence. Oh, I did send the, I sent Casper from our case, right? Okay, I'll send, I'll send another piece. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm pretty sure everything you want is sent. My computer dings, I'll call you at all. Just got it, calling you at all. Strap up now.
Um, I think we have like 30 seconds prep left. Around there. Okay. Let's see. Okay. The order is going to be, sorry, my dog's buzzing. Okay. The order is going to be aft case and then it'll move to the nag. I'll make it clear when I'm weighing. I'll signpost. Okay. Everyone good? First, they read this overview about bad policies because we're controlled by the rich. They don't respond to the analysis that the end result is pay, meaning that in the end, they're going to get credit for their debt and being pulled out of debt crises. As long as they don't interact with the solvency of the debt crises that the IMF has interacted with in the past, we win the link. But then go to the turn that they read about moral hazard. They don't respond to the analysis that Avital gives you that it's benefits versus harms. A minor moral hazard is not worth letting an entire economy collapse and putting all those people in danger. Those are the just the general case turns that they put on our case. They didn't put any specific defense on our case at that point you can <clears throat> clearly vote for the AF. go to the neg if you look at their c5 we read two d links the first one we say that the imf is currently fixing issues and modernizing their conditionality which means that on net they're actually changing for the better they continue to cite the 80 percent card but avatol already indicts that evidence and tells you that oxfam simply recommended that they did, like cut social spending they didn't actually have to countries just negotiated that second we would say at the point that our solvency still stands and that we're fixing debt crises clearly the imf's changes are working we also tell you a dealing about how the imf needs to have precautionary finance measures and that's through loan conditionality they just talk about like private financers but that's unresponsive as in so far they need the link into the imf go to their c5 about agriculture we give you the non-unique saying that the hr hrc 20 finds that the un helps 86.7 million people in 83 countries every day every year by delivering food assistance which means their problem is solved regardless this evidence postdates their evidence which means that even if there was food insecurity it's being solved back regardless clearly their evidence doesn't account for this but either way i would say that our argument about the economy is a prerequisite because what you're seeing in our argument is that $11 trillion of debt are in the economy right now and COVID reduced developing economies by 60%, which means they're at risk of large debt crises, which lead to long-term financial crises and decrease investment in GDP for decades. It the IMF is providing assistance to 80 countries and Gallagher is <clears throat> says the lending now pri prioritizes social spending, giving countries more time to repay their debts. Investor confidence is declining, but the IMF provides the necessary insurance. Anything they give you, the IMF solves for. But debt crises spread and the IMF solves. They don't interact with the fact that like the I they don't don't extend the fact like any like defense on the solvency about how the IMF ex like solved the Asian debt crisis or even like Mexico, Korea, Argentina. At that point, every 1% decline in developing country growth leads to another 20 million people in poverty and a global debt crisis will push millions of people into unemployment. I would say that unemployment serves as a prerequisite because if you don't have a job, you can't pay for food anyway. And I would say recessions exacerbate this because it makes, it makes everything more difficult for people to work and actually produce food. At the point that you're not seeing their weighing happen or that their access to their link, I would say it's a really really easy affirmative ballot because recessions and <clears throat> unemployment always come first because money is always the link into any solvency that they want in their case at the point that they're not responsive to that it's a really really easy app ballot ground right yeah I just have a first question whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. Even if you buy like Oxfam just says recommending, A, it says social spending. So how does that even help? And B, like we tell you that like these privatization policies and land grabbing policies have already been enacted in the past. So how does that apply to our case? Because there's no, like your card doesn't say that the IMF was like, oh, you have to do this. like. It's not like one of their conditions. It was that the IMF recommended that condition and the countries took it on. Like that's yeah. just something that the countries took on themselves. No, that's Oxfam. No, that's not our case. Our case, Honeywell tells you that the IMF forced these countries to, to privatize their land, also dissolving all their subsidies. So allowing these private equity funds from abroad to buy up all the land, that's our warranting, not okay. the like Oxfam thing because it's Oxfam's also like kind of specific to social spending. But you can take a question. This response was in rebuttal, like the front line was in rebuttal, and then you didn't respond to it in summary. So it goes conceded. I said it in summary that A, Oxfam says, man, they be our things already happened in the past. So, like, the social spending stuff doesn't respond to like. Hey, 
Okay, but like I also told you that first I indicted the evidence and then second I said that as long as we're fixing debt crises, we're seeing on net bad better effects and then I did the weighing saying that re like recessions and debt crises are specifically bad. So let's continue on you winning your case about solving debt crises. Okay, that's fine. You can yeah. go. Okay, Ava told you have a question or should I go? You can ask. Okay, let's talk about moral hazard. Do you think it's worth it to let a country's like economy collapse just because of some risk of moral hazard? Oh, well, we never said it's okay for these companies, for these countries to collapse, but you don't interact with our warranting is that why moral hazard occurs is because the IMF lets them know they're going to cover their losses. You just say that there's no moral yeah. hazard. Well, like we have contradicting evidence. So you have to prepare our side because we give you the warranting about how the yeah. IMF is always going to bail them out, which is why moral hazard does occur and a hundred banking crises were caused by this moral hazard. But the problem with that is that we provide the warrant, you just provide evidence. Like I would say that the warrant outweighs the evidence insofar as we tell you that like without, like you don't extend anything that contests our solvency about the IMF solving these debt crises, which means as in so far as the IMF is allowed to step in and stop those crises, like I would say the benefit outweighs the harm. That's the analysis that Avital gives you in second rebuttal that got extended into my speech. That's not that's not the that's not the warranting though. Like first, Avital just said that like moral hazard doesn't actually exist, which you don't give a warrant for. Tell you other, it like takes into account all different factors. It's like it's a pretty good study that like looks at but it. even beyond the study, the analysis, like it doesn't matter because if we solve the financial like problem, then like it's okay to risk some like moral hazard is always going to outweigh them possibly needing more help in the future but i think that's time okay, okay. order is our C5, the investors weighing, which I'll make clear what it is when I get there, and then um, just impact weighing. So like our argument and then lots of weighing on the links. Is everyone ready? Okay. You vote on our contention five about agriculture. What we tell you is that because the IMF steps in, they end subsidies for government agriculture and they privatize all land, allowing private investment to crowd out public investment. That's really bad because what Burning Woods Project 20 finds is that when private investment is taking over these sectors, they always pull out in downturns, which is really important because every small recession means the agriculture sector collapse, which Ivonic 16 says raises food spreads, um, increasing global by 30%, and Maria Mariano 18 finds uh, 124 million people were pushed into starvation because of IMF policies. They just say two things. First, they say that it's changing for the better, but then they also say that SAPs are good. This is a clear contradiction. At the point, we proved to you that SAP still exists and that they're bad. And even if it's not austerity cuts, it still cuts into privatization. That's really clean for us. Then they say the UN helps, but they can clean drop Leo's frontline that says that the IMF is creating the real problem. And it's always better when you, and the more the IMF comes in, the more people that the UN needs to help. The UN doesn't solve all of this. Then they say social spending and COVID econ, that's their case. The most important clash in this round is the link on investors because their argument about solving for debt and increasing growth is dependent on investors coming back in after the IMF bails them out. Don't let them concede that link to their case and it still access their impact. Why do we outweigh? First on strength of link, the investor argument is dropped by them in every single speech. So we like they have no link into their case. But second on investment, because we both agree that investors always leave in downturns to, ma to minimize their losses, which is why every single time there's a downturn they always pull out which means their growth never happens and it also short circuits because the economy goes bad first because once the IMF comes in everything becomes privatized which means every small recession which happens very recently very often because it's a boom and bust as Leo tells you means that they never get to the long-term growth that they end up talking about that takes out their case but then on the impact weighing we tell you that it's a prerequisite to have food because if you don't have an agriculture sector you never reach development they say like they don't interact with any of Leo's weighing so you can extend that they say like poverty means you can't afford food, but we would say it's the other way around because the people before the IMF, the 124 million people still could afford food even though they were in poverty. But when the food price spiked, they were pushed into starvation, which is much worse than poverty. Please negate. We're gonna be running our about 30 seconds of prep.
Okay, that's all our time. Is everybody ready? Okay, perfect. Time will start now. Let's start with moral hazard really quickly. This is a benefit versus harms topic, preferred analysis because we provide the warrant and analysis. Then on the general case terms, there's no specific defense on the case. We'll get to that later. But they're confused about our case. Our case is about investors leaving and the IMF cushioning the landing. They think that it's about investors in general, but we're saying that when there's a debt crisis, there would be less, less investing anyway. The warrant that we provide the warranty that's necessary because we say that it helps economies even if there's a small even if there's a small risk of moral hazard but then you can clearly extend cleanly extend our second contention about wildfire spread it's the best place to sign your ballot today because car is 20 finds 11 trillion dollars of debt in the economy and OECD finds COVID reduced finance flows to developing economies by 60 percent Walsh finds the low-income countries are a risk of large debt crises leading to long-term financial crises and decreased investment in GDP for decades the IMF provides assistance to over 80 countries amid COVID which should never actually uh, interact with directly but then we tell you the debt crisis spend that IMF solves is because IMF bailouts helped countries like Mexico and Korea stab stabilize your debt against something that goes conceded and not responded to at any point in the round. And there's a negative relationship between debt and growth, a 1% decline in developing country growth, which means 20 million people go into poverty. A global debt crisis today will push millions of people into unemployment around the world. Again, none of this is actually responded to, but you can go to their case anyway. On contention five agriculture, IMF is fixing issues and modernizing its conditionalities and changing for the better. They still don't respond to this, but Oxfam simply recommends they didn't have to, they didn't have to do any of these. Countries are still negotiating. Then the IMF changes are working because debt crises and solvency is unresponded to again. And then we tell you that the IMF needs uh, needs finance insurance. Our HRC finds that a UN helps 87.6 million people. This postdates their evidence. This evidence doesn't even account for this. But then they don't interact or or extend any offense how IMF solved the Asian debt crisis and helped other countries. This is a really clean way to vote for us today. They push millions into un unemployment, which is a prerequisite, because if there are no jobs and there's no access to for payment that's needed to buy food, you need the jobs in the first place. You don't see their weighing happen either. Money is the link to any solvency. They are not responsible for any of this. Then they literally say that recessions cause agriculture default, but the IMF cushioning the landing of any investor pullout. We are argue that a pullout is inevitable and that the IMF lessens the impact and that their impact is worse in their world because recessions are happening in their world, hurting hurting their case as well. So we would say that because we're providing people the jobs and what they need to stay out of poverty and recessions, you're going to be seeing all of our impacts happen before theirs. Very, very proud to affirm. Good round. Wow. Good round. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you Thank so you. much. Good round, everyone. Thank you, guys. Good round. Um, Neg, could I please see, or actually AF, could I please see the Oxam evidence? It might already be in the email chain, but. Yeah, um, I'd like to see that too. Actually, I don't think it is, so let me pull it up for you. I'll let you know when I send it. I'm pulling up a doc, so it might take a little time.
Um, I know the card like doesn't have a citation. We don't have the link. I mean, we have the link. We don't have a citation. Is that okay? I was looking for the one with the citation, but I can't find it. Yeah, if it's like a URL to the. It's the cut card, and then there's the link. I have the citation. Oh, we do. Oh, no. did I add it? Find it. <laughs> okay, wait. Give me a second. Oh, I got it. Okay, never mind. We're good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, I just sent it. I'm gonna take a few minutes to read some evidence and review my flow um, and let the other judges do the same. And then once we've all submitted our decision on tab, we can disclose and give RFDs. Good round guys, good job everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.
Okay, I just submitted my ballot. It looks like I was the last one to do so. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, give our decision and give my RFD and then I'll let the other judge that is here give theirs as well. Um, congratulations guys on making it to doubles. Great debate, everyone. We have a 3-0 decision for the negative. Congratulations, Milburn. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and give my RFD first. Um, this this was kind of a messy round for me. I don't know why moral hazards was talked about as much as it was, especially as it pertains to investor confidence, which just doesn't carry a ton of weight in this round. The more you guys start talking about agro and food, which is what both final foci really boil down to anyway. Um, I don't know why you didn't hit harder on, I know they respond to it in rebuttal, but I don't know why you didn't hit harder on the Asian financial crisis and the 110 billion stat committed to South Korea and China and Thailand, because those are some of the really, like really the only actual impacts you guys have about investors shifting money from riskier to safe options. So at the end of the day, there wasn't enough offense. There's quite a bit of defense in the AF final focus um, for me to give it to them, even with extending the Oxfam evidence. So at the end of the day, I thought Neg did a better job weighing and I give it to them for their prereq on food security. But great, great round, everyone. This was this was tough. I spent a while looking at my flow and looking at the evidence. And you should all be proud of yourselves for making it this far today. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, definitely a lot of the same things on AF. I, I do agree that the impacts weren't as fleshed out and extended as well. So there's a lot of repeating of the phrase, like the IMF just helps countries. So like in Final Focus and Summary, you just read that the IMF is currently helping over 80 countries. The IMF has helped Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. There's no warranting about like what they're doing to help um, other than this just like, uh, I guess, link chain that you extend or like this link story that you extend about cushioning the blow after investors leave or preventing investors from leaving. Um, there's also no stats there, right? So I do think that it would have gone better if you'd extended like the argument you made about the Asian debt crises earlier on. Um, but ultimately in the final focus, there's not much to go off of in terms of um, how the IMF helps these countries' economies recover from a recession or stop them from falling into a recession. Um, on the other hand, I do think NEG starts off weighing pretty early and their link story is really clean with um, their like food argument. Um, so like I buy that even if one, I do buy that like austerity measures still probably happen because the Oxfam evidence says that encourages um, and in some cases does require um, so like, even if it's, I guess, like a minimal difference, I still lean neg on that austerity measures are likely, especially if I don't resolve the app impacts on like debt, debt relief. Um, but even then neg makes a pretty good argument about how it's not just austerity measures. It's also just like forced privatization, specifically in the food industry. Um, and they give evidence that says like 124 million people, I think specifically because of IMF related food policies are in poverty. Um, so I think just like the weighing and links there are pretty clean. Um, there's like really good weighing in second summer or in next summary um, that's pulled through in final focus as well. Um, yeah, so I guess it's pretty much just the weighing um, and not enough for me to go off of on app. Yeah. Any questions? All right, good job, y'all. All right, thank you for judging. Thank good you. luck, y'all. Thank Thanks. you. Good luck. Good luck.